Hello, everyone. Welcome. We will be starting the webinar in five minutes. Welcome everybody. We are just taking five minutes to let everyone in uh, to the webinar. We will start at 6.05. Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin in four minutes. Good evening. We're just giving a few more minutes for people to join us. We'll start at 6.05. Welcome. The webinar will begin in just one more minute. Uh, we're still uh, letting uh, quite a few people in. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. This evening's webinar is all about growing herbs, and the coordinator for the Master Gardeners tonight is Karen Maggio. Hi, Karen. I'm going to pass it along to you. Thanks, Serenity. Um, just some reminders as we get started. All of our participants, and so far we're up to 270, will be muted and have video turned off during the presentation. 
please use the Q&A icon, not the chat box, to post your questions to the host. Um, questions will be addressed uh, at the end of the presentation. I would try and leave my questions towards the middle of the presentation because chances are our speaker may answer quite a few questions uh, during her presentation. The event will be recorded for educational promotional use by the University of California, and we will record the presentation post on YouTube for later viewing as well, our YouTube as well as the libraries. There's closed caption available tonight when accessing the recording on YouTube. If you um, take our, our survey at the end, you, you will be sent a, a wonderful handout. So do take the survey when we get to the end of the program. So our presenter this evening is Andrea Salzman, and she's been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since 2019. She holds a gold badge for volunteering over a thousand hours and has deep passion for learning and facilitating knowledge sharing with others. Previously, the Speaker Bureau lead, Andrea, in partnership with the Contra Costa County Library, started our monthly webinars and YouTube channel, adding dozens of new educational talks. This was particularly important during COVID. Andrea currently is a speaker and educator in our Growing Gardeners Speakers Bureau and Community Garden Programs. She loves year-round edible gardening and finding creative uses for the things she grows. Her greatest gardening joy is growing and creating interesting things with her youngest daughter and then watching her older daughter harvest and make her own creations with what's growing in their garden. Tonight, you're gonna to learn all about successfully growing herbs year round, as well as the many creative uses for herbs beyond just an ingredient in your dinner plate. You'll learn how to select, care for, harvest, store, preserve, and use these amazing edibles. Let's get growing. All right. Thank you, Karen, for that lovely introduction and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening taking a little time out to learn a little bit about one of my very favorite subjects. I love growing herbs and I'm happy to share some things about herbs with you this evening. So let me kind of go through with you before we get started, the sound bites that I'm gonna share with you tonight. We're gonna to start off with some more foundational things. So we'll learn a little bit about what is an herb, what makes a plant an herb. What are the different many uses? So Karen mentioned that I will share with you some uses that go beyond an ingredient in a recipe that you use for something you make to eat and enjoy. So we'll talk about some things that you could do with your herbs outside of that. We'll talk about different things in general to care for herbs and other growing considerations for herbs. Then once we get through some of that foundational information and general overview on herbs, I'll dive a little deeper on 10 herbs that I've selected to talk about. And I'm gonna call them my top 10. They're ones that are kind of top in my heart and uh, scattered throughout my garden. I'm also then gonna tell you how you can harvest them, how you can store them and enjoy them. And then at the end, as Karen mentioned, uh, we will have questions. So, um, you know, please feel free to add in the Q&A button, um, like she said, any questions that you might have. So we're gonna have a few polls this evening. And before we launch our first poll, let me kind of talk through it and share with you all these beautiful pictures that you see in front of us. So my first question I'm gonna pose out to all of you is, which of these plants is not an herb? So you need to pick out of these eight, eight, which is not an herb. And I'll go ahead and share with you their names. Um, so in case you can't recognize them by a visual sight. So number one, that's a picture of aloe. Number two is rose. Number three is basil. Number four is thyme. Number five is borage. Number six, rosemary, seven is yarrow, and eight is mint. We could go ahead and launch the poll and then I'll let you guys cast your vote to which you think is not a nerve of these eight. And your choices are, is one, two, five, and seven not an herb? So that would mean that aloe, rose, borage, and, and um, yarrow are not herbs. Are all of the above herbs? or none of these herbs. I'll give you a, a little bit of time to cast your vote. 
All right. I love it. We've got really high participation in the polls. Thank you. Okay. It looks like the majority say all of the above are herbs. Yeah, it looks like uh, let you share the results. So it looks like the majority got of you got it right. All of the above are herbs. And you might be saying, well, how is aloe or rose? or borage, or yarrow, how are those herbs? Well, let me go ahead and tell you. I'm gonna just close the poll myself. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you, when I tell you, described you what an herb is, this will kind of answer it for you. What makes a plant in your garden a herb is three things um, and possibly two others. Uh, but the main things that make an herb, uh, a plant an herb are it has fragrance. So if you think about that prior si slide, think about the rose. That's why that rose um, was a correct answer for being an herb. Or you could see the woman in this picture is you know, taking in the aroma of a lavender bundle. That's why lavender is an herb. An herb is also a plant that you might use for flavoring. So this is kind of, this is the common way that our herb is known. You know, you could see on here some thyme and sage um, and oregano. Those are all ingredients that you use to add flavoring to your cooking. An herb can also, a plant can also be an herb if it's used for medicinal value. So some plants on the other side, like yarrow or aloe, those are certainly plants that are, you know, have a history of having medicinal value. So why they were included in that herb list. An herb can also be something that you use for like a dye or to make crafts. So our focus today um, won't be on, unfortunately, the medicinal value. Um, I'll be focusing on the fragrance and the flavoring um, and then how to grow and tend to those type of herbs. As master gardeners, we are not trained on the medicinal value. So I won't be able to, I won't have any information on that or answering any Q&A on that. But if you fill out the survey, I have an excellent resource from kind of a renowned herbalist um, that is a great way to dive in if you're interested in the medicinal value. So I made sure to include that for some of you that might want to explore that. But our focus will be on fragrance and flavoring. So what is not a spice? So um, a spice, an herb is not a spice, unfortunately. So we, we think a lot of times when you go down the spice aisle in the grocery store, we see basil, thyme, oregano, those things that really are herbs, right? Um, because they have the flavoring. Because um, remember, it's fragrance, flavoring, or medicinal value. But um, spices are not considered an herb. And let me explain to you why. So typically, you know, with an herb, it has those three things that I said, we're using like the leaves and the stems and sometimes the flowers. Flowers. A spice is typically something that you grow for its root. So think about turmeric, or you grow, it's um, a plant that's grown for its bark. So think cinnamon or berries or fruits. So those are not things that would be considered an herb. Those are spices. Um, so you can um, kind of chuckle to yourself when you're cruising down the spice aisle in the grocery store and you see an herb and you could, you know, kind of laugh to yourself like I do and say, this is not just a spice aisle, this is a herb and spice aisle. So keep that in mind. It's kind of a fun little fact. One of the things that I want to talk about, and I'll be talking in depth about plants in each of these life cycles, is that all plants out there, um, they have, um, they have different life cycles. So some plants are annuals, some are biennial and some are perennial. And this is the life cycle of a plant. For how long does it grow and bloom? And you know, and for herbs, produce those leafy greens or, or the flowers that we desire to use uh, for the fragrance or flavoring or otherwise. So the first is an annual. Annual are those single season plants. So those are gonna be the plants that you buy in the spring, you plant, they grow um, and bloom and produce for you. And then typically after the first frost, they're gonna die back and then you'll take them out of your garden. So they're there for a single life cycle. Biannuals are plants that will last a little longer. Um, they'll grow for two years in your garden. So you'll plant them and then they'll grow and eventually bloom and you'll know their time to pull them out. 
perennials, these are gonna be a more permanent fixture in your garden. Um, they'll be there growing and producing year after year after year. Um, typically what will happen is they might have a dormant period where they die back or you prune them back and then um, they'll regrow the next year um, based on the roots that are still in place. I wanted to make sure to put this out there because it is a foundational aspect when you're looking at growing plants to really understand what the life cycle is your plant so that you know, um, you know how long to expect to have in your garden. Um, and there's different care that's required for a biennial or a perennial compared to just an annual. And as we talk through the different plants that I've picked to talk in depth about, we'll talk about plants from each of these life cycles and um, you'll be able to, and I'll point out um, those differences in care and needs um, based on the life cycle of those plants. So this is kind of fun. This, this is a lot of these pictures are things I've taken at home. And so I mentioned, and as we got through the top 10 plants, I'll talk about some fun uses too, but there are many, many, many uses of herbs. And in the handout, I did include a really great book resource that has by edible plant, um, a lot of creative uses for it. So um, make sure to check that out on the handout if this is something that speaks to you. Um, but one fun use of herbs um, is to make tea. I'm kind of, I'm drinking a little herbal tea that I made. Um, I like to make a little cold brew, keep it in the, um, the refrigerator to sip on during the summer. And it's fun to use some herbs to make warm tea in the winter. So um, herbs are great for tea. They're also a ton of fun to make syrups and vinegar. So um, this picture right here, I uh, made a simple syrup with coconut syrup, that uh, coconut sugar, that's why it's dark. You could also use honey or white sugar. Um, and I made a lavender simple syrup, which we have a lot of fun adding to like lattes. Um, you could add it to ice creams, all a bunch of things. You could also use herbs to infuse vinegars um, to add different flavors to vinegars, which is a a lot of fun as well. Herbs are great addition to beverages, both for flavoring and um, as you can see from this picture, also to add a little decor or garnish. Um, so it works well for mocktails and cocktails alike. Um, so it's fun to grab something from your garden and make up a fancy drink for friends. Uh, it's also fun for decorative use. I have here some platters. Um, I like to put all things edible. So we have some edible narcissums um, and some basil flowers, some other edibles on there. So they're fun for decorative use, whether it be on a platter or they're really beautiful in flower arrangements. I think one of my favorite arrangements that I made was with um, fennel and, um, and red clover and the blossoms from chives. So red, pink, green, and it was really beautiful and it was just an all edible. So it's kind of fun sometimes to make a little arrangement of your herbs and bring, you know, to, uh, to a host or someone who, you know, whose house you're going over to and say, Hey, you could enjoy this. And then you could also eat all of it if you choose to. So really fun to use that way. Herbs are also great for kind of more um, things that you can make. I don't want to say cosmetics, but, um, you know, different things that you could use, you know, kind of, um, you know, for your own beauty care or body care. Um, some things we love to make. We, these are some gifts that we make during Christmas time. We um, try to find things in our garden um, that we can make as gifts for friends and families during the holidays. So, Bath salts, a big favorites. Um, we, I taught um, some teenagers how to make these as part of a self-care class that we taught. Um, they're great to add your favorite herbs. And this, this particular one had lavender, um, orange zest, and uh, uh, rose petals that I had dried and, and kind of um, we processed. So super fun. Put them in little containers for gifts. Sugar scrubs are also great. Um, this one had, um, I, think, I think it had lemon and lavender and um, they're great um, to make essential oils out of. So you can infuse your oil, um, you know, the beneficial properties out of a plant. Um, this particular jar here has calendula from our garden and we used, um, and, and I used it, and I did another infusion where we did calendula and lavender, and we use that for hand creams that we made. 
and lip balms. My, this is my younger daughter, Julia. She loves to make stuff like that with me in the garden. We're always kind of, she looks on TikTok and I look on, you know, wherever I find articles and uh, we kind of find some fun ways to make different things. So, um, and all these containers I just found um, online um, and a lot of them you could buy in bulk. So it's kind of fun to find new and interesting things to do. And the other wonderful use of herbs is that they are fantastic pollinators. So we all want our, you know, our gardens to grow and things to pollinate and get all those benefits of our growing and the yields of crops we want. And pollinators, you know, are fantastic to helping us along in addition to what we do as a garden. Um, the flowers on, uh, on herbs, I mean, the bees, butterflies, hummingbirds just love. You can see this hummingbirds feeding off a sage, um, this um, butterfly is feeding off some rosemary flowers and this bee off some chive blossoms. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I just love going into the garden and, um, you know, not only seeing, if you look at all these plants are all herbs, there's different textures and colors and sizes and shapes and then, you know, you're attracting these pollinators. So you get to hear the, you know, hummingbird flying back, you know, uh, buzzing around you and the bees swarming all around, you, pollinating your garden and the beautiful butterflies fluttering around. So it's super enjoyable. And obviously it's beneficial to your garden too. So there are some um, kind of foundational things and some creative things that you could do with herbs. Now what I want to do is spend a little bit of time just giving you some foundational things that might apply to caring for all herbs. And then I will get into talking through some specifics when we talk about the top 10. So if you've been to any of our webinars, you for sure have seen this slide. This is on repeat in all of our webinar programs, and there's a reason for that. Um, these four foundations of success, soil, water, aeration, and sun, really are what we call good cultural care. If you can maintain these good cultural care, have the right soil for your plant, the right amount of water for your plant, the right aeration, whether it be in the soil or above the ground, you know, giving your your enough space around or between your plant and the right sun, those things are really going to help um, your plant thrive and produce a lot of yields and hopefully be pest and more pest and disease free. So let's talk about how that applies to herbs in general. It's really important with herbs, you know, each plant whether it be an herb or an ornamental plant or a tree, whatever it is that you're planting, every single plant has its own, um, you know, own conditions that it needs to grow optimally. Um, and really, if you look at those cultural care that we talked about, um, those things, if you get them nailed down, they're going to help you make, you know, grow your plants successfully. You know, that's the soil, water, and sun. But when you're looking at those plants, it's not only what does that soil, water, and sun need, but you want to make sure that when you're looking for a home for those plants, uh, whether it be in, you know, mixed in a container with other plants or in your landscape, that you group those plants together based on the same soil, water, and sun needs. So, you know, some plants require shade and some require sun. If you plant a, plant, a shade plant in the sun, um, it's just going to not do well really quick. And the same thing, if you plant a full sun plant in the shade, it's not going to do well either. And the same is true with soil needs and water. So you really want to read that label on the plant when you buy it to understand what each of these needs are for your plant. So let's talk first a little bit about soil. Um, for as it pertains to herbs, most herbs thrive in well-drained soil. Um, so what does that mean? Loamy soil. Um, loamy soil is that soil that kind of looks like if you break up a, a brownie and it crumbles easily and nice, that's going to be kind of a loamy, kind of rich in organic matter kind of soil. Um, some herbs, and when we talk about the top 10 herbs, you'll hear that some really thrive in more um, sandy soil. Um, so, you know, read and understand what's right for your herbs, but whether it's loamy or sandy, you know, herbs generally thrive well in well-drained soil. What they don't thrive well in um, are, you know, um, soil that's not well-draining. So that would be a lot of our soil, not in all parts, but a lot of parts of Contra Costa County, we have heavy clay soil. Um, water does not drain very well in that. 
So if you are in a part of our county that has that um, uh, clay soil, you will want to amend it with like compost um, so that it be can become more well draining. Otherwise, what happens with herbs is that the water is going to sit too long and they're going to be subject to root rot, which could um, end up, you know, killing or damaging the plant. Water. Um, so water varies by every plant. So it's important to know that generally speaking, uh, the water requirements for um, herbs are anywhere from regular to low. So what do I mean when I say regular water or low water? Regular water means you just want to make sure that the plant is, you know, the soil that the plant is planted in is moist at all times. Kind of like if you were to feel it, it would feel like a well wrung out sponge. So you don't want to stick your finger in it and it's just like, you know, just drenched and it's, you know, a ton of water in there. Um, you don't want that. Um, so you just want it like consistently moist. So it's not going to get too overwatered and it's not going to get, have, go, be completely dry. On the other hand, some herbs grow well in low water. So what does that mean? Those are gonna be the plants that are gonna, you know, probably want, and we'll talk about this, more sandy soil. Um, so it's well draining and, um, um, you know, it have dry periods between each water, watering. Um, typically, when we talk about the life cycles, annual herbs um, are gonna be needed to be irrigated less deeply, typically about four to six inches in deep depth because um, that's about the depth of their roots, whereas perennials that are a more permanent fixture, um, they're going to be needed to be, you know, irrigated up to a foot because they're going to be have more established root system than the perennials. So think about that. And the frequency of the water is really going to depend on the time of the year and the climate where you live. So most herbs require six plus hours of sun some more of the cool season herbs um, require less for about four hours. So read the plant tag and really understand um, what that means to make sure you're giving your um, herb plant the optimal uh, amount of sun. Once you kind of maintain all of these things, herbs are pretty easy to grow. You know, you've got, you've got the soil down, the water and the sun. Um, they're gonna really thrive if you're really taking care of those conditions. And also um, they'll help them be a lot healthier. I want to talk a little bit about um, the selecting where to grow. Um, just to reiterate, I mean, when when you know we get questions about why did my plant die, a lot of the reasons is not having the right amount of water or sun. Um, so what do we mean when you go to the nursery? Because you've heard me say, look at the tag, uh, you know, and it says full sun or half sun or part sun. What does that even mean? So full sun is going to be like six plus hours of sun. So there are herbs in this category. Um, when you hear partial sun, um, that's going to be two to four hours. Half sun is somewhere in between about four to six hours. Um, so it's something just important to kind of know where you have, say at the most all sun, it's going to be six or more part down to four, you know, two to four, and then halfway in between is that four to six. So just wanted to mention that. So if you are at a nursery reading a label, you'll be able to understand what that means from light hours. The other thing for caring for herbs are looking at what are some pest disease issues, pruning, fertilizing, and mulching that you might need to do. Fortunately, I'm here to share the very good news that most herbs are really pest and disease free, especially if you maintain those good cultural care, the water, soil, sun, and aeration. Um, there are some pests, um, aphids or, or um, are spider mites that um, are common with some herbs. Um, and we do have a really great, I put it in the handout, but our University of California has a really great website called UCIPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. You can search on there by plant. So you could say type in rosemary, or you, if you know what the bug is uh, or the pest is, you could type that in or the disease and you'll be able to pull up a quick sheet that will give you pictures of the pest. Um, it'll give you um, tips on how to eliminate it. And, um, you know, so it, it's a quick little one page document in the handout that I provided for those 10 plants I'm talking about that might experience some pests. I did put the name of the pest and the hyperlink to the IPM website. So that'll be there for easy reference for you. 
But again, most herbs, especially if you maintain good cultural care, um, are pretty free of pest and disease. Some of the perennials, um, if you overwater them, might get root rot. Um, so just maintaining, you know, that even um, or for those plants that are low water, you know, not making sure they're not getting overly wet. That's going to help prevent something like that. So pruning, um, herbs aren't, are like other plants. There, there is some pruning and care required. Um, so let me just talk in general about it. And as we get through the specific um, plants, I'll talk about what that particular plant needs. Um, pruning for annual herbs, so these are single season plants, um, those are gonna be done during the season because there's the one season that they're growing. So for those of you who might have, um, you know, gone out and harvest your um, herb, that's considered pruning. Harvesting um, your herbs regularly is going to encourage them to continually grow. I was just teaching, um, gosh, a couple weeks ago, my older daughter, the one who likes to cook a lot with the things I grow in the garden, I was teaching her how to uh, prune or when she goes out there to harvest basil. Um, the kind of trick to do. So you can see this plant that this lovely ladybug is on and see how it has the stem that comes straight up and then the leaves that are growing to the left and to the right. Um, one of the ways to, in, to encourage um, an herb plant to grow bushier, and this applies to ornamentals too, is if you were to um, snip it right here, um, you will then encourage lateral growth. So when I, I told my daughter, when you go to harvest your basil, find the stem, how, how, how much you want, and go down and, and uh, clip it off right above these two um, leaves. And then that will happen. You'll get the herb and the amount that you need for cooking. And then you're going to also be encouraging the plant to grow and thrive more. So um, harvesting is one way to prune annual herbs. Um, another way is um, you'll hear me talk that a lot of herbs are really gonna be at their best optimal flavor before they start flowering. So when you go through your garden, um, if you start to see flowers um, develop, um, go ahead and cut the flowers off um, or prune it um, you know, below the flowers. That'll keep the plant growing um, and having the best flavor and taste. So that is another way that you could prune um, your annual um, herbs. Um, perennials do require a little bit more care. Um, typically in the first year, um, you're going to be kind of pruning and shaping that fresh, soft part of the plant and then um, uh, or to none, depending on the plant. And then the second year and beyond, um, it's going to require a little bit more pruning to keep the plant from becoming more woody. And when I go through um, talking specifically about some of the perennials I've selected to talk about, um, I'll illustrate and talk to you how to prune those um, so that you can understand um, the additional care that the perennial that you know, there in your garden year after year will require. A fertilizing, fortunately for um, herbs, they really don't require that much fertilizing. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we really do encourage um, not using any kind of uh, and other, also uh, the pest and disease, going back to that really quick, since herbs are really kind of um, pest and disease free, we really discourage using any um, pesticides because that can, um, you know, prevent those beneficial um, pollinators like bees, butterflies, et cetera, from coming to the plants. But really, you know, um, if you're doing the good cultural care, minimal to no fertilizer would will be needed. Um, mulching. Mulching is a great way to conserve water and keep the soil cooler, maintain that right consistent um, water um, um, consistency and levels in, in your soil. There's a couple of different mulches that you could do. Uh, compost. Um, when I plan out my garden for the year, I always love to spread a top layer of mulch, of compost around the plant that really helps retain water. Um, and it's going to give some, you know, a slow release um, fertilizing almost to the plant year round. Um, you could also use wood chips. I like using straw. Don't use hay, use straw. Um, adding a couple inches of that um, around your plant. You just don't want to put um, straw or um, wood chips, other types of mulch right up to the stem of the plant. 
that can prevent some type of root rot. So just kind of space it away. Um, you know, go if you look at the plant, you know, just do a couple inches away from the center of the stem um, to give that air circulation to the soil. But those are some just general ways that you can care for your herbs in general. So what are some um, growing other growing considerations? You say, okay, I want, I, I know what herbs I want. Um, I understand the sun requirements, what type of soil I need. I understand the light, I've got it. But then you say, you know, kind of where am I gonna, where, now where do I plant this? There's lots of different options um, with herbs, where to plant um, and what to grow in. So let me talk about some considerations that you might wanna do. Um, as you can see from, um, from this picture, we, there's many options. We have a, um, on the left, I have a old gutter. Um, um, I had told a girlfriend who's getting a roof, hey, save your gutters. I want to hang them around my fence and uh, plant some, you know, shallow rooted plants in them. Um, and they ended up uh, getting thrown away before I could scoop myself over there in the evening. So fortunately, I had a master gardener friend who, had one just laying around and I was, uh, he was happy to um, get it out of his house and I was a happy recipient to grow some herbs in there. So, you know, look for things that you could, you know, upcycle and uh, reuse. Um, terracotta pots are great. Um, half wine barrels are great. Um, there's so many other different containers, obviously planting in ground or raised beds are great containers. One consideration you do want to do is make sure that the containers are for annuals, at least eight to 12 inches in depth. Um, you're going to need that amount um, to really make the plant um, grow optimally. Um, if you're planting a perennial, um, you, most of them are going to require much deeper than that. So I'm um, get, you know, over a 12 inch deep container. Um, but I do want to show you just an illustration, um, both this um, you know, more, this is about, this um, gutter is about, I think it's about maybe six to eight inches deep, maybe nine inches deep. And this wine barrel obviously is a couple, it's much deeper than that. Um, both have English thyme planted in them. And what I want to illustrate from this is if you give plants the space, they will grow. Um, so this plant, both of them are mature. Um, this plant in the gutter has been, which sounds so bad, um, it's been in there for several years, but it maintains really small, which works fine for me. I don't use time a whole lot. So I just go out there and trim a little bit um, when I want some. Um, this plant and this other um, bed that I have, it's, I kind of let it flower. So it's more of ornamental value. Um, but the same plant in a larger space grew much larger. So um, that's just something to take into consideration. You know, if you want it to grow bigger and you want more volume, um, grow it in a little bit bigger of a container. Lots of options though with herbs. So the focus of the presentation tonight will be growing um, herbs outdoors, but I know growing herbs indoors um, is something that's really popular with a lot of people. So I wanted to make sure just to give you some tips and tricks and considerations if you're looking to grow indoors. Um, so the one of the most important things um, to think about is the light. Um, you know, the herbs when you're growing them indoors will require six plus hours of light, you know, about six hours. Um, and if you don't have more than that, it should be fine. But you're going to need to find ideally a south, west or east facing window that's going to get you that six hours of light. Um, really south facing is going to get you there the easiest. So if you say, well, geez, I, you know, I don't have a south facing window and the window I have has just three hours. It's, um, and, and can I not grow herbs? Well, you can, there are so many great options out there. You can get a grow light. Grow lights are very easily, you know, something that you could buy, whether it be at the nursery or online retailers. Um, they come in lots of different sizes. I have one that I could clip onto the edge of my um, the, uh, uh, edge of my countertop, and it has three adjustable arms. Um, and so, if you don't have enough light, grow lights are a great option. If you go the grow light option. You want to make sure the light is at least six inches above the top of the plant. So as the plant grows, you just need to move it up, which is why those adjustable grow lights are great. 
Also, you don't want to keep them on for more than 14 hours because every um, you know plant does require a period of nighttime, um, you know, dark period. Um, so a lot of the grow lights also come on timers. So it's super, you know, you can pick how many hours you want. Uh, maybe you get four hours of light, so you just need it for you know another you know two or four hours. Um, you could choose. So grow lights are a really great option. Um, when you pick a container. Make sure you're picking a container, like I said, that's gonna be that kind of eight to 12 inches in size. You you know, I know those smaller terracotta pots are super popular. Um, they're just not gonna grow that big. So that's just something to keep in mind. Make sure whatever container you use has drainage holes. So you could see this container here is in a pretty little, um, you know, like um, ceramic dish, um, you know, so that way when you water it, it has something to catch. Um, the excess water that's drained out through the drainage hole. So drainage holes are really important. One common thing that people say when they're growing uh, indoor herbs that is might be common to see if you don't have enough light is that they become leggy. So kind of really tall and spindly looking or maybe leaning towards the window. You know, they're trying to search. <laughs> they're saying, we're at light, light, where are you? Um, so even if you have that proper light, you might um, see that a little bit, that leaning plant. So I always like to say just, you know, once a week or so, turn it, and that'll help keep the plant healthy and um, standing straight up. Um, microgreens is another really great way um, to grow plants indoors. I have a talk on our YouTube channel on growing microgreens. Um, herbs grow great. I was at a restaurant, uh, a Mexican food restaurant with my parents and kids, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, early summer, and my daughter and I ordered this nice corn salad and on top were cilantro microgreens. Um, so of course I kind of geeked out and I thought that was super cool. So that's also a really fun way and really when you grow microgreens um, from start to finish, when they get this size where they're ready to harvest, it's usually about seven to 10 days. So it's pretty quick too. Um, so you could keep the variety going. The other thing I want to say is that if you ever, um, you know, want to then move the herb outdoor, you're tired of it growing inside, just give it a couple week period that it can transition. So slowly bring it outside a few hours in the morning, you know, keep extending that till it's fully acclimated to the temperature outside. Um, and then you could, you know, transition out to the garden if you're tired of it um, in your kitchen or wherever it is that you have that six plus hours of sun. Another thing to consider with herbs are, are you gonna go buy a seedling that's ready to plant now at the nursery or are you gonna plant for seed? It really is a matter of preference. And as you'll hear when I talk about some herbs, there are some herbs that are better grown directly sown into the soil. So that's one thing. If the um, herb is better um, grown directly um, sown into the soil, you'll definitely want to acquire those seeds. Um, and for all seeds that you grow, really read the um, instructions on the packet to understand what the right light hour is, how much water, the depth that you plant the seed, time of the year to plant, all of those good things. One advantage of growing seed is that they're cost effective. Um, you know, you could get a whole seed packet for the cost or less than the cost of one um, seedling at a nursery. So it's definitely cost effective. My husband might argue because of all of the time that it takes and the water that it takes, et cetera. But, you know, it's super, it's fun if you're into that. Um, so also one of the things I think is really great about seeds is that you have access to unique varieties. So a nursery is going to sell, you know, those varieties of herbs that are really common. There are some herb specific nurseries that you're probably going to get more variety, or if you're really chummy with your nursery um, worker, they might be able to special order them for you. It's always worth asking. Um, but in general, with seeds, you can find a lot of different varieties. So um, that is kind of unique if you're looking to try something different. Um, time commitment to grow, you know, if it typically takes, depends on the herb, it will take a couple months from start to when the plant's ready to grow from seeds. So if you're looking to plant, you know, say basil with your summer garden and you're doing that in April, you're gonna need to start your seeds indoors in February. So that's something to think about. Do I have the time um, to invest in that? Um, whereas if you go to a nursery, um, you'll be able to plant it immediately whenever it is that you're ready. So the seeds, it does take a little bit time longer to harvest, um, especially if you're, you know, picking, I'm going to direct sow it um, versus buying a seedling. 
Whereas if you go to buy the seedling at the store, it's ready immediately. So those are just some things that food for thought um, to think about um, if you choose seed or seedling. If you go to buy a seedling, um, remember this model, start small, grow big. My husband and I have had this ongoing conversation and I this is a slide I pulled from our Growing Gardeners program, um, which is our free beginning gardeners program um, that we ho hold several times during the year is, you know, um, it's very easy to get carried away to see that, you know, one gallon, sometimes five gallon tomato plant, you know, in the spring that has fruit on it and it has flowers and you're like, yes, that's what I want for my garden. Well, the problem with that is that um, the plant is already pushing all of its energy into fruit and flower development. Um, if you opt for that smaller one, um, when you plant it, it's going to be putting all its energy into growing a really, really healthy, robust root system. That's going to uptake more water, nutrients as your plant grows, and then flowers and fruits. So I used to like to use this example. I uh, brought over to my dad one time this like little tiny basil plant. Um, this is actually a large leaf basil, which is my very favorite variety. It's so prolific and it's very easy to propagate from seed. And I noticed it sitting on his patio uh, the next visit. And I said, what, what's wrong? Why aren't you planting this? And I think he kind of thought it was wimpy and wasn't going to do anything. I was, you know, trying not to be offended, but I said, you know, just trust me, just plant it. You know, I kind of might've hovered over him a little bit and forced him to plant it right there, you know? And, uh, but this is what that teeny little plant that he had no faith in, it grew. Look at how big. If, if, you, if you start small, it's going to establish that root system. Now, I would say with this pot, <laughs> in the hot summers, you probably want to put it up off the concrete. That's going to get the soil probably too hot. You're going to use a lot more water. But this one plant with, you know, you can see it's on a drip system, given the right sun, the right soil, the right, right amount of water, it's going to grow and thrive quite large. So um, start small and then grow big. All right. So we've got a lot of our foundational information away. I'm ready to talk about um, my top 10 herbs that I picked to share with us tonight. Um, these are um, kind of my own, you know, favorites. Um, you are welcome. You know, there are the options that you could choose to grow as far as herbs are endless. So I told you we're going to break it up by a life cycle. So annuals, again, these are single season plants. They'll, you'll plant them, um, they'll grow, thrive, and then you'll take them out of the ground. When I say take them out of the ground, with the annuals, what you want to do is cut them, cut, follow the stem to the bottom soil level, cut that off, and leave the roots in place. That'll leave some organic matter in the soil. So I had somebody, a friend say, gosh, I just don't know what I did with this plant. I'm so disappointed. I thought I gave it the right sun and water, and it died. So I asked her, what, what's the name of the plant? Well, it turns out it was an annual plant. So I told her, you didn't do anything wrong. It grew and it bloomed and it thrived for you. And then its life was done. So if you've ever had a plant, maybe you think thought would kill, maybe it was an annual. So that remember, they're just gonna last one season. So basil. Um, basil is a warm season herb. Um, so it's something that you're gonna be um, planting in the warmer months of the year. There are lots of different varieties of basil. Um, it comes in, you know, different colors and different flavors. Last year we grew a cinnamon basil. Um, and you can see from here, there's, you know, the standard green basil. Mount Magic basil is one of my very favorites. The stems, the veins, and the undersides of the leaves are purple. I like to let them flower at the end of the season. You could see from this picture what a beautiful purple flowers they leave. Really, really pretty in floral arrangements. And the taste is that traditional um, basil taste that we all grow to love. So when I say it's a warmer season plant. That means you wanna plant it in the spring and then it will grow during the warm summer months and until the first frost. Um, the first frost, then you'll just cut it down to the ground um, and the plant's life cycle will be over. So you're gonna be planting basil like when you plant your other summer garden, um, you know, maybe your tomatoes and other plants. What type of soil? It likes loamy, rich with organic matter, um, well-draining soil. Um, basil does require regular water. So, you know, it wants to be um, consistently moist. Don't let it get the soil get dried out between waterings. 
it is full sun, so that's six plus hours of sun. It is going to grow depending on the variety. So read the tag; they could grow one to feet, two feet high and wide. Um, you know, this mountain magic basil is one single plant, um, so you just want to make sure that you provide enough space for it to grow its full size, and also make sure it's not going to crowd out um, or overcrowd other plants that you're planting around it. Basil is best before it flowers. So, you know, this basil right here that's flowered is not gonna be at its optimal, um, you know, taste. Um, so during the growing season, what I do is I go out into the garden and I just am constantly picking off the tops of the, you know, you could see usually at the very tip here, a flower will bloom. So when you start to see that, just kind of pick it off um, and that'll help keep the plant growing. Um, I mentioned that it will, you'll remove it after the first frost. Um, I like, there's a lot of different things you could do with basil. Um, using it fresh is great. It, it dries very, very well. And I'll talk later in the presentation on how to dry basil. It's also excellent for things like uh, pesto. This is, a, I think we made 12 cups of pesto one year from one plant of Italian large leaf basil. So uh, it's really, really good um, in you know floral arrangements or dried or fresh or in um, sauces. Borage is my next. So this is one member on the poll um, where we said which one was an herb and borage is an herb. It has um, its flowers, leaves and stems are all edible. Um, it also is a warm season plant. So this plant you're not going to find as a seedling in nurseries or you may, but it's not going to be very common. You are going to want to look for the seeds if you wish to grow this plant. Um, and I'm going to guess if you direct sow it one year, you will probably never have to do that again. I think I direct so borage maybe, I don't know, five years ago in one of my garden beds and I've got it, it reseeds very easily. Um, and so you will probably have a lot of starts throughout the year. I had so many, I just pull them out and I start handing them to friends. So um, it does uh, readily reseed and the bees adore this plant. I mean, this picture right here has a couple bees. You could just go out there during the sun hours and see bees just flying all over. So it's a plant that I love to plant um, in my garden and it's pretty easy to grow. Um, it also wants well-draining soil, full sun. So that's six plus hours of sun. And you do want to keep it regularly moist. The stems of borage are hollow and um, so it does really need to keep moist on a regular basis. I went away for vacation and I had my drips on, but we had a really hot spell that I wasn't expecting. And I came back and my borage was just woof, wilted over. Um, so it really does need that really regular, the soil to be moist on a regular basis. Um, once the leaves are fully formed, um, you could harvest the leaves. Um, the flowers you could harvest at any time once they're fully open. Um, and they're really pretty to candy. You could see I use them to decorate the top of a cake uh, along with the leaves. Um, and they're really fun to add in ice cubes. Um, it's really fun to add to a cocktail or mocktail or maybe just a regular old glass of water like I did here. Um, so it's, it, it adds a really pretty kind of flair to thing. It is a little prickly. You could kind of see some of that here if you look closely at the pictures. Um, I like to garden without my gloves, but when I'm gardening with borage, I always wear my gloves because it gets kind of itchy and scratchy. Um, so if that's something that bothers you, it's something you might want to consider. It will die with the first frost, so then you'll just cut it down at the soil level um, and uh, keep the roots in place. Cilantro. Cilantro is the next annual. So cilantro, whereas borage and basil are a warm season herb, cilantro is a cool season herb. Um, cilantro um, has kind of a more strong, pungent taste. Um, some people actually, like my college roommate, um, has the gene that makes um, cilantro taste almost soapy. So, you know, maybe you don't want to grow cilantro if you bear that gene, but if not, it's a great, really flavorful herb to have in your garden. Um, it does bolt very easily and you can't stop that. And what bolting is, is basically once a plant bolts, um, it's telling you it's at the end of its life cycle. So you want to harvest the um, the leaves before it bolts because it will get a little bit more of a bitter taste. 
So here's a picture of um, cilantro bolting. You could see the stem almost looks a little bit thicker and you could see the leaves are a little bit more wispy. Um, so you're not gonna be able to stop bolting, but you can slow it down. So when you see this start to happen, I just trim the stem down to the bottom to cut that off and then kind of start harvesting the cilantro more regularly because I know that it's gonna get close to the end of its life cycle. Behind this bolting of cilantro, um, a cilantro that I bought that is slow bolting. So um, I would recommend if you're gonna grow cilantro to look for the slow bolting variety. Um, it is cool season. So it's a great plant to um, plant in the fall um, when the weather is still cool. You can either plant a seedling you buy at the nursery or it is something that is easier to direct seed into the soil. Um, so if you're direct sowing anything in the soil, the key is moisture that um, seeds need water to germinate. So just make sure to keep all the time until it gets to its full size and you know you could back down to regular water and keep that soil moist at all times. Um, it does require part shade, so it's really going to do better in the two to four hour kind of location. So think about that when you're um, growing cilantro. It will grow, uh, you know, about like a, a foot or so. So think about that also when you're looking at spacing. Um, Harvesting, so once it bolts, you can cut it down. You could also let it flower like I did here. You could see it gets these wispy little white flowers, which will then turn into seeds. Um, you could bring that indoors, hang it upside down. I, I like to put a brown bag around it so if any of the seeds drop, you have it there or lay like a towel or sheet below it because um, otherwise it creates kind of a mess. It's hard to clean up in closets. And then you could harvest each of these little seeds off, um, you know, roast it in the oven and you'll have some coriander seeds. So that's kind of a little fun trick with cilantro. Dill is the next plant not to be confused with uh, fennel. Um, I kind of looked into this when I was putting this presentation together. The foliage on dill and fennel look very similar, but uh, fennel is an annual or, or the green Florence variety is with a bulb, whereas dill you're gonna be using it solely for the foliage. And the taste is a little different. Dill is kind of a cross between that um, fennel-y taste, but also like a little celery. So it's not quite as um, strong. Um, it will grow um, these clusters of yellow flowers, which the bees adore, and you can too. They are also edible, those flowers. Um, it does not, some people say dill is really, um, and I'm just starting to get into dill, so I haven't grown it a whole lot, but one of the things that you hear often is dill is kind of a little pickier to grow. A um, couple things to look at is starting it from seed. It is, it is difficult to transplant. Um, and making sure you have adequate water and um, the right soil conditions, um, sorry, sun conditions. So it does want full sun and regular water. So make sure you maintain that moisture, have it in six plus hours and direct seed it. That's gonna give you the, the optimal conditions to grow that plant success successfully. Um, give enough space, it can grow several feet um, wide and even taller. So make sure you allow enough space um, to grow. And um, you could pick the leaves once they've fully developed. Don't cut any more, you know, cut about a third of the plant. Don't cut more than that. So you could cut down the top third and then the plant will keep growing and thriving. Um, the dill is great in pickles. I think dill pickles, you know, that's where uh, very popular in pickles. It's also great with, in, with fish sauces, um, with potatoes. Um, so it's really good use in culinary. And it is a really beautiful foliage to use like in floral arrangements too. Okay, so moving on to the biennials. Um, there's really just, there's arguably two, but really one um, herb that's in the biennial category that we're gonna talk about. So again, these are herbs that last for two years and that's parsley. So there's a couple of varieties. You have flat leaf, and curly leaf parsley um, and that you can choose to grow from. The taste is slightly different. Um, flat leaf parsley, they say it has a, a little bit um, kind of more bold, if you wanna say parsley is not bold, but it has a little bit stronger of a flavor um, and it, it retains its flavor a little bit better when you're cooking it with heat, like for culinary use. Um, so it's, it's my favorite. I, I like the taste of it a little bit better. Um, so this is a plant that I have in my house. And I just keep it right outside my kitchen. So when I want to go and harvest some for a meal, I could just slip quickly outside and snip some off because it's something that I use often enough. 
but both, whichever variety you choose, um, they both grow very lushly and they're both really vigorous plants. Um, again, that will last for two full years. So parsley is also a cooler season plant. So it's best to plant it in the fall and then, um, you know, start it in the fall. It's going to do a lot better. If you choose to grow it from seed, it does require cool weather to germinate. So you will need to definitely start it in the fall or even winter um, in our climate. It likes rich, well-draining soil. Are you seeing a trend with annuals? These annuals love that rich, well-draining soil. <laughs> and it also requires regular water. So always maintain that even moisture. Once it's established though, um, you can back off water a little bit. Sometimes I might skip a day, even in the summer, and my parsley does just fine, but not for very long. Um, so you can back up once it's established after its full first year. You know, parsley, they say it's full sun to part shade. I would really, I would suggest just in my experience that four to six hours, I wouldn't do more than six hours, um, you know, because full sun is six plus hours. I have noticed my parsley is probably, um, it gets like good morning sun um, and afternoon shade. Um, but during really hot days, it sometimes gets sun scalded where the edges, um, the margins of the leaves get a little, it looks burnt or dried. Um, so that's why I really think keeping it in, in kind of that four hour time period is you're going to get, um, you know, better results from parsley. So when you harvest, pick it any time. Once the leaves are about, you know, six, eight inches big, lush and green, um, you can, you can harvest them. What I like to do is harvest them kind of around the edges. And then, um, cause that tends to kind of be the older growth and then it kind of is falling over. So I kind of, to keep it upright and keep it growing lush, I like to just trim around the edges and grab that. And you'll just cut it down to the soil. Um, and with parsley, it's great. You could, I trim up the, um, the leaves and the stems. So both of those are great. Um, you will know that it's, finished with its two year life cycle once it starts to flower. So it'll, you know, grow and produce the leaves for the first two years. Sometime in the second year, it will shoot up like white flowers. Um, it's bolting and then you know it's the end of its life cycle. So you could just trim it down to the base um, and uh, harvest what's remaining. Um, you know, you can dry parsley, um, in my personal opinion, and I've read some articles that kind of back this up a little bit. Um, it does kind of lose a lot of flavor when you dry. I mean, all herbs lose flavor when you dry it, um, but um, I, it parsley seems to be more so. Um, so I like just to use it fresh, but again, you could dry it and see if you like it. Um, and yeah, definitely harvest it before it flowers um, and it will have a, a less bitter taste. Okay, so that was our one biennial. Let's talk about uh, the perennial, uh, my very favorite perennial first. So chives are super popular in our family. We love them. Um, we love them for the taste. If you like that good oniony taste, um, it's not as pungent as like a red onion, you know, the onion bulbs, and it's also gentler on your stomach too. So if onions kind of give your body a problem, chives are a great alternative to get that same flavor. Um, but they're just a really super reliable herb to grow. Um, and it's a perennial, so it keeps on going and going. The, I have this chive in a pot and I have another chive in a um, raised bed that I've had growing there for, I don't know, five years or so. My daughter and I were at, grew um, a bed at a local community garden. This is before I was a master gardener. So it must've been six or seven years ago. Um, they have us take out the plants at the end of the season. And so I knew my onions had much more life than a summer, uh, my onion chives. So I dug them up and I separated them and I uh, planted them um, in a couple containers and they're still growing. So they really, really are uh, reliable. And we kind of have a joke at our household that I joke with the kids, they put it on everything. Like, would you like a bagel with your onions or would you like eggs with your onions, uh, you know, with your chives? I mean, they put them on everything. So it's pretty versatile, good pop of flavor. Um, chives do tend to go dormant in the winter time. So you'll see they're growing and thriving and all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, I harvested it and they're not growing. Is it dead? What's going on? That's okay. That's pretty normal. And then come the next spring, they'll start growing back again. So that is very typical of chives. Um, there's two different types. There's onion chives. They're called regular chives. I like to call them onion chives because they taste like onions. Um, 
and then there are garlic chives. So those taste, they um, kind of look similar, but if you, let's see if I could zoom really quick. If I zoom, you can see onion chives are a little bit round. And if I scroll over to the garlic chives, you could notice, you could see especially here and look at this, they're completely flat. Um, so they do, before, um, onion chives will have a pink flower where garlic chives will have a white flower. Um, so when they're flowering, it's easy to tell them apart, um, but you could tell by the shape of their leaves. Um, the Adaptive Learning Center, which is a community garden I work at, they grow regular onions and regular chives. And it's a fun exercise that I've done sometimes with the folks that garden in that garden to say, how do we tell which is an onion and which is, a, which is garlic? And it's the same thing with a real clove of garlic and a real onion is that they're gonna, onions will have the round, leaves and garlic will have the flat. So that's kind of a way to remember it. You want to plant it in the spring um, and then make sure to have enough space for it to grow 12 to 8 inches in, um, in width and height. Um, it is a good choice for a container because it does tend to spread. Um, so you might need to either just maintain, you know, if you plant it either in ground or in a raised container, you might need to separate it every three to four years or not. Um, so that's just something to, you know, think about. That's why I like to plant them in containers, but they do well in my raised bed too. They also like average, you know, kind of regular well-draining soil. Um, and actually they're not really picky. Um, they could even take a little neglect, which, hey, I mean, we all need a plant that can take some neglect. <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if you forget watering for a couple of days, you know, chives usually are gonna stay strong with you and, and do well. Um, the only pest that really um, is more common with chives and I've gotten in a number of years are, um, black bean aphids. They literally look like the teeny little black bean. So the aphids that you might see like on your rose shrub might be like, like lighter colored. Um, these are definitely black. So, and sometimes it's, you don't see any and then the whole entire plant's infested and you can't really easily spray them off like you can other types of aphids. Um, if you get black bean aphids, don't worry. Um, just trim the plant down to the ground, you know, maybe leave, um, leave like an inch or two. Um, and you could try spraying it off, but usually that's, it's going to be too late. Um, and then it will grow back the next season. Again, like I said, I've had it happen a number of years and my plant year after year is still growing and producing. Um, let's see what else. Uh, sometimes it might, they might get a little bit dry or yellow. Um, you could see this plant has a little bit of yellow. You can maybe give a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, um, but you know, usually um, it's not necessary with chives. Um, you don't need to remove them. It's a perennial. So again, it will grow year after year. You might just need to divide them if they get a little bit large. Some creative uses for chives. Um, remember in the beginning, I said um, herbs are great for infusions. I love making chive vinegar. Uh, this is a fun thing we did with the same community garden I was talking about earlier. Um, it's a good idea to cut off these flowers before they seed. So then they don't, you know, reseed in your garden unless you want them to. Um, but I love just clipping them off, saving them, and then putting them, this is a just white balsamic vinegar. And I just put it in the mason jar, shake it. And I do that for about a week. And then I strain it and put it in another mason jar. And you have this white balsamic vinegar will have a really nice chive flavor. Um, they're also excellent to cut up and put in like butters, um, or as I said, my kids put it on every single dish. It's to them like, uh, you know, ranch dressing is to other people for dipping. <laughs> okay, the next uh, perennial I'm going to talk about is oregano. Um, there's over 20 different varieties of oregano that you could choose from. Um, so many different varieties. Um, it is a really kind of beautiful plant um, and you could, you know, plant it in containers or in the ground. It does tend to spread or it will spread. Um, I planted it originally. So it is a good choice for a container. Um, I had originally my cousin uh, for her wedding that the favors they gave away were these really cute terracotta plants with herbs. 
And one of the benefits of being the last one there is that you get to take some of the extras, which when I was offered them, of course, I said yes. Um, the sage and oregano that I have pictures in this presentation are from her wedding that was, uh, what, I think, 10 years ago. Um, I moved them out of the raised bed because they were growing so much. And I moved them into a space and I'm just kind of maintaining them a little bit smaller in my garden. But they will spread. Um, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, containers are a good spot for them. Um, you could plant them either in the fall before the first frost or in the spring after the last frost. Um, you do want to plant them in really well draining soil. Um, you know, sandy soil will even um, do well for um, oregano. For oregano, so if it is a little bit more clayish, you do want to definitely amend it um, because if it's exposed to long periods of you know, wet period, the roots, it will be, be susceptible to root rot. So make sure you have really well, kind of even sandy with a little bit of grit in the soil. Um, water is, you know, kind of medium water. So again, just maintaining even moisture for that first year. After that, you could back off and it's um, a low water plant. So, and it's considered drought tolerant, which means, you know, it can go all the way dry between watering. So that's nice too, um, to have a plant in your garden that's there year after year, that's going to be on the low water um, um, side. So I mentioned in the beginning that some perennials are going to have a little bit more um, pruning requirements. So oregano is one of them. You're going to want to cut it back um, in the first year, you know, just kind of snip it off to harvest it and to shape it how you want. That second year and beyond, uh, I do recommend once in the spring and then another time in the um, summer to kind of prune it back like about a third. Um, so then you could use whatever's growing fresh or dry it. So when I do that, I usually then just um, I'll, I'll explain how to dry plants, but um, I, I dry them. Um, that'll help keep the plant growing and thriving, looking really healthy and lush, um, and also make sure um, you know you, you'll be able to prune it then before it flowers. Um, the taste isn't as good as with other herbs once it flowers, um, but a lot of times I let a big part of the plant. You could see if this is a large plant um, go um, to flower because the pollinators love it. So that's just something to do, and it is very good both dry or fresh. Rosemary. Rosemary comes in a couple different varieties. There's either the upright variety, which you could see here, um, or the prostrate variety, which will kind of fall down over a container in this example, or maybe a hillside or, um, you know, a terrace or a wall. Um, so there are two different varieties um, that you could choose from. The flowers, the bees love them, and the flowers on rosemaries are also um, edible. So these kind of prostate varieties are really great to, you know, that you could shape them into a topiary area. You can make them into a hedge. You can even use, you know, them as basters when you're barbecuing or soak them in water and use them as skewers for barbecuing. So rosemary has a lot of versatile uses, you know, in addition to harvesting the herbs, which you could use dry or fresh. So plant in the fall before the first um, frost or before the first frost or spring after the last frost. You do want more sandy soil. So I mentioned root rot with oregano. Uh, Rosemary is even more particular about that. So really sandy soil is gonna be the best for that um, because if soil becomes compacted or it's exposed to the, that water for a long time, it is gonna not do well. It is drought tolerant once it's established. Um, it wants full sun. It is very sensitive to full um, dramatic pruning. So that first year, um, kind of gently um, trim back some of the soft green stems. Um, and then um, it, and you want to, you know, you could do that throughout the growing cycle. Um, in the subsequent years, late spring and summer, um, you know, kind of more regularly prune it um, about a third of its shape. Um, that'll help kind of keep that lush growing and help prevent it from getting woody. Don't ever prune it. You know, if you prune it all the way down to the wood, um, you know, the fresh green is not going to grow off the wood or it most likely won't. Um, and it could, could cause health problems with the plant as well. Sage. Um, is another great herb. Um, it's very popular, very earthy. 
um, um, herb and the pollinators love it. Um, it comes in a lot of different colors, foliage. You have kind of your standard green gray foliage that you could see in this plant in my garden. It also comes in purple, variegated, and there's a tricolor sage that's like, it looks variegated with like a blush um, color through it. So super beautiful plant, um, really lots of different colors for the flowers as well. You wanna plant that in the fall or spring. Um, like the other perennials I've talked about, and it does need well-draining kind of loamy soil to thrive. Um, it also will be, you know, subjected to root rot if it has prolonged um, exposure to really wet conditions. So make sure that that soil kind of dries out for sage between waterings. And once it's established, it is considered drought tolerant. It does like good circulation. So, you know, as the plant starts to grow, you might want to think about when you're pruning it, look for, you know, um, different stems that you could cut to the ground to help, you know, kind of aerate it out so it's not quite as dense. That's going to help um, with sage as well. Um, and so, you know, during that first year, you could prune it as you harvest it. And, you know, like I said, maybe create some more space for aeration. That second year, um, you want to trim it in the spring. Um, and because a lot of times it'll really start to get too dense. Um, so you want to do that during um, the second year for sage, kind of trim it down. When to harvest, you could harvest throughout the year when it's growing its leaves. And like most herbs, it is going to be um, better to harvest before it flowers. And the flowers are really beautiful for ornamental use. Um, they're excellent plants to choose dried um, or fresh. Really popular you see in a lot of shops is making like these um, sage, um, burning sage. So if you have a lot of extra sage that you're growing in your yard, you can make these sage bundles. Um, they're said to be like a purifying and really cleansing um, and they attract positive energy. So if you have a little bit extra, you can make it in your own garden. Um, English thyme is the last herb that we're going to be talking about. Um, there are 20 different varieties of um, thyme that you can grow as a ground cover, and there are over 10, that, 10 varieties um, that you could grow for culinary use. They come in different, you know, foliage colors. As you can see here, there's variegated thyme. Um, they come in different, you know, shapes, um, flavors. This particular one is lemon thyme. There are other um, flavors of um, thyme that you could grow as well. So they're really a great variety and they're really beautiful as ground cover too. Um, you know, um, they just, they spread really nicely. They have a nice scent in your garden when you're walking over them. Um, um, so really pretty for both culinary use and also um, a beautiful addition in the landscape, especially if you're using for ground cover when they flower, it's really pretty not only to have that soft foliage with the good scent, but the beautiful flowers as well well. You want to plant um, thyme in the fall after um, before the first frost or in the spring after the last frost and you also want well draining soil um, for thyme. Um, once established, thyme is, um, you know, is a low water plant so it will be, you know, be successful growing um, if you let the soil dry between waterings. It can get, you know, depending on the variety, it can get about, you know, four to 12 inches in height and width. Um, so do read the instructions to see um, how much space you need to provide that plant in your landscape. Um, it will, anywhere it touches the soil, it will root, so it will spread. So you could kind of see that here, the plant dipped down and touched the soil. So now it's going to begin spreading out that way. And it's done that over here too. Um, so that's just something to think about. It's a, it's a really good addition to a container to help contain that, or you just need to kind of prune it out to keep it to the right size and shape that you want. Um, in the spring, cut back the foliage by about a third um, to keep the leaves growing, and you'll be able to do that before it flowers. Um, and it'll also keep it less woody. Um, during the growing season, you, you know, you could do light pruning. So just pruning off what you want to use fresh or want to dry. Um, and it is a pretty pest and disease free plant, which is um, always a bonus for us gardeners. One less thing to have to worry about. Um, it will, as I mentioned, same with the other plants, it is best to harvest it before it flowers. I love the, um, you know, the flowers on thyme. They're not really, they're a little bit small, so it's not one you really use for arrangements, but they're really pretty. So I sometimes just like to leave some to have that um, flower in your garden. 
So that is time. So while I take a sip of my tea that I made, I'm gonna have you guys take your second poll. Um, I might have mentioned or might not have that there is, there is one herb that can also be a spice. Remember I said an herb is anything that has, you know, fragrance, flavoring, or medicinal value. Um, it, but there is one uh, herb that can be a spice. So is it basil that can be an herb and a spice? Is it cilantro? Is it dill or is it oregano? Go ahead and put up the poll and we'll see what folks think. <clears throat> oh, are the uh, other choices? See, here I am forgetting my choice. You could also say, is it cilantro and dill? that are both a spice or is it basil and oregano that are spice? <clears throat> wow, we have some people I, who I think picked up on my little trick question. All right. It looks, should we publish? It looks like most people who are gonna respond, responded. We publish the poll. Um, can can you see the sharing of the results? Oh no, I can't. Let me turn it off. Hmm. Frozen a little bit. Uh, it looks like number two is the winner. And number two is the winner. So remember when I showed cilantro? Um, 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 I said that you could keep the seeds and it'll pop up those. The cilantro, the plant that it grows from, um, is the herb. So that was kind of the trick question of the day. So bravo to all of you who picked that. All right, let me go to the next one. Okay, harvesting and story. And I'm going to be fast because I know we need to have time for questions. I mentioned a lot that you want to make sure to harvest before um, flowering. So that's going to be the optimal time um, to harvest um, all herbs. Um, but, you know, you can allow some to stay in your garden for that interest to having the flower and to attract the beneficials. Um, you, um, you know, um, the morning time is the best time to um, harvest uh, before the oils and the herbs are going to be most intense. Um, and for this time of the year, it's the coolest time. Um, and remember that trick I showed you at the beginning about pruning down the stem um, right above where the leaves part to right and left to encourage lateral growth. So when you're harvesting, try to do that. And then you're also pruning. When you bring the herbs in, whether you're using, if you're going to dry them or use them fresh, uh, wash them. I like you can either soak them in a bowl of water or just um, rinse them off as it's doing in this picture. <laughs> um, in, in under the sink and then allow them to dry. Remove any kind of discolored leaves or leaves that look like they got, might have gotten um, chewed on uh, by, you know, bugs or pests and then just lay on like a paper towel to dry. If you're going to be using them uh, fresh um, after they're dry, you know, you could just kind of um, wash them as you use them. Um, I recommend, as done in this, as it's shown in this picture, um, storing them in a cup of water. Um, that's you, and you could just put it on your countertop. So it kind of looks like a floral arrangement. You just plop it in your, um, in a cup of water, and uh, pick it off when you need it. That's going to keep them fresh for the longest time. If you're going to dry them, um, what you're going to want to do is rinse them, like I said, allow it to air dry on the countertop, and then tie the stems together. Um, and you can hang upside down as shown um, in this picture. I like to put like some type of towel underneath so if stuff falls, it catches it. Um, and then just allow them and put it in a cool, dark place. When herbs are exposed to sunlight, when you're drying them, it will darken them. Um, so I've had basil, like say, or mint turn black. Um, if I try drying them in a sunny spot, so find a cool, dry spot. I also sometimes just wash them, pick off the flowers, and I put it like on, on a flat sheet and I stick it in a drawer in my kitchen. And I just let it dry in the drawer. And then when you went to the touch, it crumbles. Um, that's when you know it's completely dry. You want to make sure it's completely dry before you put it in an airtight container. 
because you don't want there to be any moisture. That might create mold um, or ruin the herb and, and instead of allowing it to be kept there for use. Um, usually dry herbs last about six months, um, some up to a year, but they will, as they go along, lose their flavor. Um, so make sure to dry them um, before you use them. We have a sister program called the UC Master Food Preserver Program, and I've left a QR code up here, and their um, uh, website is also in our handout. Um, they have a lot of great videos and resources if you're interested in like pickling or canning or drying. Um, they have lots of great recipes and instructions and videos on how to do them. So I really wanted to give a shout out to our sister program um, as a really great resource for everyone if you're looking to do some of those things with your herbs. So last poll before um, we get into questions. I would love to know, now that you've heard me talk about herbs and all the different ways that you can do them, pick all, check all that apply. What are the different things that you are gonna do with herbs after hearing this talk today? Are you gonna try to grow a new herb? Are you gonna apply different cultural care techniques to herbs that you're growing? Are you gonna try growing a new variety of herb that you've already grown? Are you gonna use an herb and an ingredient in food? Are you gonna grow an herb as a pollinator plant? Are you gonna dry an herb for future use? Are you gonna infuse an oil or vinegar? Or use an herb as a homemade toiletry like lip balm or hand lotion or bath salts? Or maybe you use for decorative purposes. Love to hear how everyone's gonna use them and then we can publish it. This is the fun part, what we get to do with the herbs. I love it. You know what the most popular answer is so far? Uh, try growing a new herb. I think that's awesome. I will let give a few more minutes to apply. I think it's always fun to try something new every year. Um, ask the people you're growing for who live in your house. So yeah, it looks like that's the most popular. And uh, you know, at or close to half um, are going are interested in doing different cultural techniques. So that's the air, sun, soil, and water. Um, which are, again, are going to help your plant grow and thrive and also help keep your herb plant disease and pest free. Um, try growing a new variety uh, and using in food or as a pollinator. Those are some of the popular. So, so great. Thanks for filling those out. Okay. Okay. So here's the sound bites we talked about. We learned about what an herb is, um, the uses, how to care for it, how to grow it. We learned about the top 10. And again, all those details that I shared are gonna be in the handout and a little bit about harvesting and storage. So now it's time for you. We'd love to hear your questions. Um, Lydia and Bonnie, um, who are on the QA panel have been busy answering a lot of your questions. Um, and then we've saved some to answer live. So um, I'd love to hear from you on what other things that you would like to know or learn about with herbs. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide. Okay, wh while people are putting in their questions, just want to remind you that you can visit our website uh, to get more information. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. And if you live in Contra Costa County, you can actually visit or email our help desk to get individualized attention on maybe a problem or a question you have about the garden. And let's uh, move to the uh, next slide. Okay, I wanna share with you some of the programming that we've had this year, which is available on YouTube and some up and coming programs uh, that you can view. Uh, in August, we're managing common diseases in your home orchard. Uh, we have lawn alternatives coming up, a uh, winter edible garden, and uh, in November, capturing the light. So we hope that you will visit us for some of these programs as well. Okay, to help us better serve you, we have a survey that we'd like for you to take. And I know I saw a lot of questions in chat and Q&A. Uh, where do we get the survey? Because we all want the handout. So if we go to the next line, you'll see a QR code right here. 
you can, this gives you the link to the survey. Now, I must say, our website's been a little fickle today. So if you can't access the survey tonight, please try again tomorrow. But once you complete that survey on, on the thank you page, there is a link to that handout. So right after you complete the survey, look on that thank you page and click on the link and you will get uh, Andrea's wonderful handout. Okay, we're going to take, I'm going to leave. Uh, let's back up. Well, and leave, leave it up, Karen. Sorry up. about that. No, it's okay. I want to leave that up so everyone gets a chance to get the link to the survey. And we're going to go ahead and answer some questions. Um, we've, uh, let's see, 30 have already been answered, but we have quite a few left. So, Andrew, can you tell us the difference in lavenders? Do you have different types of lavenders that you use for different purposes? Yeah, so there are a lot of different lavenders, um, including different foliage colors. Um, there are um, some, uh, I think it's maybe three or so years ago, they even came out with a variegated, a yellow and green lavender, and a, a newer variety of it even came out this year that's a less bushy. Um, but when you're looking, there are the English varieties of lavender are going to be the um, ones that are good for culinary use. So um, like Munstead, that's one variety, but you want to look for like an English variety. Um, you know, sometimes lavender gets a bad rap that it has a soapy taste, and that's probably because um, it's a lavender has been used that's not really good for um, culinary use. I will say there are some lavender you picks near, um, near and around us. Um, that, and, uh, you know, I don't, you know, that that's where I go and kind of source my lavenders for teas, um, and other edibles. But, um, yeah, if you're looking at it for an edible though, that's the one thing to kind of look for. <clears throat> well, we have several questions about deer. And oh, okay. My, oh, my friends. <laughs> and so people want to know, uh, are herbs deer resistant? Um, I, you know, that's a good question. I, um, you know, I think some are more deer resistant, like definitely some of the, um, you know, like rosemaries, um, those that are more, more astringent, um, are going to be a little bit more deer friendly. Um, but the best of my knowledge, some of those annual herbs are probably not going to be deer friendly because they tend to grab towards that new kind of growth on a plant. Um, so put them in the backyard uh, or somewhere where your dear friends uh, cannot get to them. Okay, we have a viewer, uh, Diane, and she's creating a garden with four to six, four to six grade students uh, with diverse okay. needs. Do okay. you have any suggestions for children's books about herbs or gardening? Have you included anything for children in this handout? You know, I did not, um, but maybe we can see about getting some recommendations from the library. I don't know, Serena, if that's something that we could do. Okay. So we'll have to look into that. But I mean, if um, I could just give you some excerpt, herbs are really great. Um, if you're looking to start a plant from seed, um, you know, as like a botany lesson, um, basil is a really reliable one to start from seed. One of the things that I love to do um, in our community gardens or in education is putting the different herbs in like a Ziploc bag and passing them around and having the students smell them and ask them like, what does it smell like? And, you know, asking them to look at the different colors and um, learning about the herbs through, um, you know, sensory through smell. So um, sorry, I don't have a particular book recommendation, but hopefully those are a couple ideas you could take back to your young students. Okay. Have you had success freezing herbs? You know, I, I have, I don't, I just personally choose not to do it. Um, but so, a lot of herbs do well, frozen chives, basil, um, do really well frozen. Um, and I know, I believe if you look on the, um, UC master preservers, there's some information on that. Um, so I don't have experience personally, just because I don't know. I just have it in my mind that maybe it wouldn't be quite as fresh. So I've kind of stuck to using it fresh or I dry it, but it is an option that is really good to use. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of viewers that the survey link is currently not working. I'm sorry. So 
please, um, will we? Uh, can we put the um, the link? Uh, someone else wants something other than a QR code. Could we put the link back in chat for everyone to the survey? Save that link and please try tomorrow. I apologize, um, but our system has just been really finicky today of all days when we're having a webinar. So um, let's take one more question. We're, we're out of time. Um, let's see. A lot of questions about the QR code. <laughs> um, mint, taking over the garden. Yep. So this viewer planted in a container and then I, I guess it can grow through the bottom of the container. Yep, it will. And the sides, if you have slats. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, any mint, recommendations on mint? Yeah. So mint, I would definitely, um, I, I have put mint. It was another one of those herbs from my uh, cousin's wedding. <laughs> um, it's, um, and it, it, it grows, it has rhizomes, so it's going to grow under the ground and just spread. And it's almost impossible to completely take out. Um, you know, I'm constantly like reaching under the ground and yanking it out in the bed that I have it in. Um, so do yourself a favor and plant it in a container. Um, yes, it might grow out the bottom of the drainage hole. I have it also, I have strawberry mint in a wood container that has multiple slats and it grows out those slats. Um, so just clip it off and prune it off um, and to keep it contained. Um, but, you know, unless it's touching dirt, it's not going to spread that way. So you just kind of trim it up um, to the size and shape you want. <clears throat> but it is aggressive. Okay, I, I've got to give you one more question because this is a really fun one. And then, then we've gone over today for sure. But I also want to say that the library will send out um, the link to the survey in an email. So I know every, everyone has asked that and Serenity has posted that in chat. So you will get the survey in an email so that you can take it and get the handout. But would you plant your herbs together um, such as a salsa garden or a pizza garden? And I have to say, we're doing it in several community gardens, but I'm anxious so to fun. hear what um andrea says oh yeah i think you know that adds such interest and fun to your garden you know if you plant a salsa garden so you plant you know um oregano and um tomatoes and peppers um you know i think that's a wonderful addition to your garden and super fun and creative some people do like herb wheels where they do like a spiral kind of thing with herbs. So anything that you could do that, you know, adds interest for yourself to get you out there or to the people that you're growing with, um, it just makes it more interesting. So, yeah, I think that's that's a fantastic idea. Okay, and you know, well, that if, the, is all the if the person who asked for the book recommendation wants to put their email address in the chat, I'd certainly be able to try to look up a book for you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, we are we are out of time. There are several questions left. And, you know, I shared earlier our, our website and our link to our help desk, and you can certainly go there for additional assistance. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening. And thank you uh, to our speaker, a Andrea. Thanks for Karen for hosting, getting everyone together. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.